um, it is, it is, it is um, frustrating. So uh, anyway, um, uh, uh, welcome. Um, uh, uh, I'm Dr. Diane Page. I'm the Chief Medical Executive here at Sutter Lakeside Hospital. And um, I'll, I'm here with several, uh, several people who are important leaders uh, in our local hospital. So Dr. Ramsey Aspor is um, the medical director of our infectious disease program. Um, he also uh, um, is our antibiotic uh, stewardship leader and has consulted on probably about every single patient who's had an infectious disease problem at Lakeside in the past, it feels like the past decade. Ramsey, but I think it's been maybe more about six years. I can't remember the hospital without you. You've, you've uh, helped us and, and our patients so much. And so he's uh, going to give us um, a, a presentation about some data and about the vaccines. And um, the other people that have joined me, Dr. Um, Hollenbeck is our medical director of anesthesia and our vice chief of staff. Um, and uh, Michelle Curry is uh, one of our anesthesiologists and an intensive uh, and, and critical care specialist, intensivist, um, intensivist specialist, and then Dr. Jeannie Flum, who is uh, in the process of helping uh, birth a baby, um, uh, hopefully will come back on. She's an obstetrician and um, it's been helpful hearing her, um, her viewpoint on, uh, on the vaccine safety as well. And so um, uh, what I will do, if you have questions, if you can just put them in the chat, um, uh, that will be fine. You can also speak up because there's not many people uh, here, but uh, I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat. And, um, and, uh, and, I'll, and Ramsey, I'll just, I'll keep an eye out for you. And, uh, and with that, um, Dr. Asper, um, uh, please uh, start us off for tonight. Okay, well, uh, very great. Uh, great, great to see, uh, you all and a lot of you will be watching this uh, recorded so uh, great to have that opportunity and to be a part of this wonderful team at Lakeside. Uh, I'll start by just showing uh, some some websites that I think are uh, very interesting and uh, helpful in understanding the, the pandemic but more importantly this time around the uh, vaccines and uh, you can uh, you know, one one interesting thing that is all the messaging going around, going about the pandemic and uh, the back and forth with masking, no masking, for example, it's been challenging to understand. And I think our uh, public health agencies have have tried hard, but could perhaps do a better job in communicating that there's a lot of uncertainty around. Uh, the pandemic around, uh, you know, in, in terms of, is it going to get better? Is it going to get worse? Is there an, another new variant that's going to emerge? Why were we not masking and then masking? It's it's very challenging to understand for the average person and uh, certainly for all of us uh, as uh, physicians, it's it's very difficult to uh, to to be able to predict what's what's going to happen. And, and nobody can predict that with a very high degree of certainty, which uh, we all have to keep in mind. And uh, we have to be open and flexible. And the fact that there's uncertainty doesn't mean that uh, uh, things are, you know, we, we're, we're uncertain about many things in terms of where the pandemic exactly will go. But we are certain that vaccines are working. Uh, we are certain that vaccines are preventing people from dying, uh, and that these are very two very important principles that we need to keep in mind. The data strongly, strongly support that, which I'll start to show you. So this is from Johns Hopkins, uh, for showing that uh, there's been almost a quarter of a billion cases. There's been five billion vaccine doses uh, administered so far and uh, in the past 28 days there's been more than a billion it's a tremendous number of vaccinations if you look at uh, weekly cases here worldwide we're on in worldwide this is the third wave uh, in the u.s perhaps the fourth wave most people are calling it but worldwide it's definitely a uh, a third wave but five billion vaccine doses 
So we've that's a, that's enough time to be able to tease out a lot of the uh, side effects or adverse effects. And frankly, we're seeing very very few issues around the vaccines. We're seeing way more people have complications from COVID and die from COVID, uh, and and that's really what's what's the, what the bottom line is. But we'll go through that and answer questions and, and show you. This is a brief update from Johns Hopkins. So as you can see, there's a lot going on worldwide uh, about, uh, uh, you know, and in our country, uh, a lot of places, especially in the South, you saw Florida, Georgia had the most vaccinations yesterday, uh, and uh, Florida, Georgia, Texas now leading the country in the number of vaccines being administered, partly because, as you saw also, that the, uh, the, the data from those states is uh, looking really bad. Florida uh, is super full of, uh, with, with COVID. Sorry, just showing you, uh, this is the world. Let me just uh, skip ahead to USA. So still more total cases than any other country that are confirmed. Probably India leads the world in cases because uh, the data, you know, they're, they're, they're not testing as often as we are. Uh, and it's probably an underestimate. So total cases, you can see daily new cases uh, really in, you know, coming up and in uh, active cases in the United States, total deaths. Let's pick uh, Florida off, off the list here. Uh, show you what things are looking like there. So total cases, as you can see, the slope here is increasing and daily new cases is well above the peak in the winter months. So uh, that's quite concerning. Uh, as you know, mask mandates, for example, are illegal according to Governor DeSantis. And uh, that, that's, that's something that perhaps uh, has led to more cases, but also the vaccination rates have been much lower in uh, Florida and, and other states like that. Uh, what's happening in Lake County, actually just skip ahead here, uh, we are, uh, at uh, fully vaccinated 54%, so lower than uh, the average for the state, and partially vaccinated 8.9%, so kudos. I think quite a few people have gotten at least uh, a dose recent, relatively recently, and you can see that our cases have uh, really spiked and uh, are, are hopefully trending down a little bit. I think, uh, I think we're seeing slightly fewer admissions uh, to our hospital, uh, at least uh, with COVID than previously, but still seeing quite a few. Uh, this is the World uh, uh, Explorer, just showing you how many countries are, are vac vaccinated. If you look at United States, you know, we're well below many countries uh, in, in terms of rates of vaccinations. So we've, we've fallen back quite a bit. Uh, looking at daily confirmed new cases, uh, you know, U.S. is pretty up here. This is per million people. So uh, U.S. Uh, France is on the way down. Uh, Israel is uh, going up. Uh, and Israel is one of the most vaccinated countries. Now, this is, you can look at data in many ways. And I want to illustrate that this is just showing that the, the rate 
uh, in Israel is high, but this is not showing hospitalizations, which are actually down uh, in Israel. So the it, in, in Israel, there's certain populations, for example, some of the Orthodox that are not participating in the health care system and not, not necessarily getting vaccinated uh, at high rates. So uh, th that's been a problem uh, in, in certain communities that, that have not taken up the vaccine. Also in the Arab population is in Israel, the vaccine uptake has been a little lower, uh, a lot of mistrust, et cetera. But uh, so some of the same problems uh, that, that we've had. Iceland is uh, nice to see. They've really gotten a Delta wave here, uh, which is the only big wave that they've really had uh, under control because they're almost 80% vaccinated. So really you need a, a high rate of vaccination to, to get this under control. Uh, with Delta, many older Americans, and red means unvaccinated here, yellow uh, means vaccinated. So Scotland is better than the rest of England, uh, but just a comparison uh, that you know they, they are doing better. Now they got their Delta under control. We have not, certainly in, in especially in certain areas, uh, in, in the US. Uh, so as you can see, uh, numbers of vaccinated people are increasing, uh, percent point increase in people vaccinated uh, from June 6th to August 21st. So you can see that, uh, you know, 12% increase in a lot of these southern states where the vaccination rates were poor, a lot of people are uh, jumping on and, and getting vaccinated. And uh, you know, as, as I mentioned, it's worse in Florida than before. And uh, you know, one thing that uh, you know, Phil Valentine was a uh, ardent uh, host, and uh, sometimes some uh, balance on on both sides of the political divide here. But even Fox News is reporting uh, that. Uh, uh, you know, people like, uh, you know, many people are now changing their tune. And sadly, uh, Mr. Valentine passed away from COVID, uh, and, but not before he wished he had had the vaccine and, uh, and started recommending it, actually, in a statement that he released to his station. Uh, we're worried about children. That's another reason to get vaccinated. Children under 12 are not eligible for the vaccine, which is a major concern. And uh, we, uh, uh, we, we need to really keep that in mind. Uh, and that, as that's one of the only ways to protect our, our children. Uh, and so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll skip over this. And uh, what want to talk about how the uh, mRNA vaccines work. And I think that's uh, uh, really important to know that they do not enter the nucleus of the cell. A lot of people have that argument as to why uh, they don't want to get the vaccine while well, they're injecting me with uh, Bill Gates's microchip or uh, that it's coming into my nucleus. Well, it doesn't. mRNA is a un relatively unstable molecule and that's the challenge with uh, these vaccines, which have actually uh, been around for quite a few years in the lab. They just haven't perfected it in terms of uh, creating this lipid particle. It's, an, it's a nanoparticle that is able to stabilize the mRNA and inside. And that's very important, the ability to stabilize that mRNA um, is, is key to, uh, and they stabilize it with fat. It's basically a little bit of fat, a uh, small fat particle that uh, has no preservatives, nothing harmful in it. Uh, some There is that chance, you, you probably heard of uh, allergic reaction to the vaccine. That's an allergic reaction basically to the polyethylene glycol, which is a component of soap. So it's it's, it's rare, it's uncommon, and completely treatable and an immediate thing. If you have a reaction like that, it's, uh, it, you know, it's over quickly. And then 
uh, you, you get the protection. So uh, it injects a sequence, not the actual uh, spike protein here, but a, a sequence of uh, um, amino acids, a, a, a small genetic sequence that will tell your body to make the spike protein. So this is not from a virus. This is artificially synthesized in the lab. It cannot integrate in your DNA. It cannot go into the nucleus. And, uh, and then the way it works is by uh, the body, your body cells, some of your immune cells will make the spike protein and the antibody uh, will, uh, an antibody will form against it and start to give you protection. Now, uh, the reason we need to make a booster dose is that this does not last uh, very long. And the, if it had gone into your nucleus and you got uh, ongoing production of these spike proteins, we wouldn't need a booster dose. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Uh, you might not need booster doses if, uh, you wouldn't need booster doses if this actually did go into your DNA. Um, the Johnson Johnson vaccine works differently. I'll, for an interest of time, I won't go into those details, but uh, there are some nuances there. Uh, and uh, while Dr. Flum is still on the line, I would like to just also mention that uh, this is a big study of maternal and neonatal morbidity uh, and mortality, so death and sickness from uh, COVID uh, itself. And uh, you know, a multinational cohort study, uh, COVID in pregnancy was associated with substantial increases in severe maternal morbidity, which means sickness and mortality, death, uh, and neonatal complications when pregnant women with and without COVID were compared. So pregnancy is a major uh, issue in uh, COVID-19. Pregnant women are much more susceptible to severe complications from COVID than non-pregnant women. So that's something to keep in mind. That's been the case for influenza, especially H1N1. Uh, and, and other uh, diseases. And the uh, COVID-19 advisory group from the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology is in line recommending uh, COVID uh, vaccinations for uh, women that are thinking about getting uh, pregnant who are uh, uh, pregnant or who have just given birth. So at any stage, and any trimester of pregnancy uh, is then deemed safe and shown to be safe uh, to get uh, COVID vaccination. And as Dr. Flum mentioned earlier, and we'll talk about uh, that might protect the, uh, the baby as well. But Dr. Flum, why don't you make some, uh, uh, have your input on uh, COVID in pregnancy. Hi, I'm uh, Jeannie Flum. I'm here uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the, the vaccination that is safe, as uh, Dr. Ashford uh, reported, in any and every trimester. So it does not have a preservative in it, which is one of the concerns in pregnancy. So you can get the vaccine at CVS, at Safeway, at any uh, clinic or uh, place that's providing it and it, that vaccine is safe in, in pregnancy. And people are concerned about, you know, is it going to harm my baby? And, and just the opposite, there's been lots and lots of data out now that shows uh, that there isn't an increased risk of miscarriage, um, that there isn't an increased risk to harm of the unborn that actually they're starting to measure antibodies in vaccinated women, um, antibodies against the COVID illness um, that may actually be protective for the baby. Now that data is not out yet, but they are starting to um, measure those antibodies. Like some of our other vaccines, whooping cough vaccine, for example, which we know gives some, some protection to to the um, unborn at the time that they're born. So um, the concern about, I'm gonna wait until after I'm 
done being pregnant, wait until after I'm breastfeeding. With, with that, then you are taking a greater chance because pregnancy is an uh, immunocompromised state, which means you can get sicker easier. And as Dr. Ashford showed that study, that you, the illness that you get is much more severe. And so if you're trying to protect your unborn baby, protecting yourself is number one. We know that moms get sick, babies get sick. So if we can prevent uh, you from becoming ill, that's the best thing you can do for your baby. Even women who have a, a mild disease at some point potentially have a reduction in the oxygen flow to the, to the placenta and ultimately to the baby. And if that goes on for any uh, time, it can interrupt. And we know that COVID increases risk of preterm birth for a variety of reasons. And, and so vaccination in, in our opinion, not only American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, but also Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, not only recommends, but strongly recommends the vaccination in all trimesters of pregnancy. So I encourage anyone who has concerns about the vaccination to please reach out to us, um, either your OBGYN provider, um, anybody who can talk with you about risks and benefits and um, support with, with the data that we now clearly have that, that vaccination is the, the best bet. Keeping masking, keeping hand washing and social distancing is still important either way. So thank you, Dr. Ashford. Dr. Fung, can I ask a question? This is Michelle. Sure. Yes, hi. Um, one of the things I, I guess I was wondering, um, because I'm just not sure how practices differ in other places, but is it, um, is it all standard practice that, you know, women who do have disease that's severe enough to require oxygen or, you know, have, you know, require hospitalization in and of itself, um, is it sort of, you know, you see where I was before, it was essentially standard practice that if you were sick enough to be on oxygen, if you had any inflammatory marker changes, any chest x-ray changes, that you were delivered essentially once you were at all viable, had a viable pregnancy um, to deliver. Yeah. Is that at all sort of standard anywhere or? Well, we're constantly weighing out. Once you get to the state of viability, okay. meaning the baby can potentially live outside your body, we're constantly weighing out what is the risk to living outside, going to the NICU or treating mom and keeping mom pregnant. And when you start to have situations where oxygen is falling um, and you're not able to, to get oxygen to the baby, you know, you have to take that chance and a premature baby then ends up depending on its own lungs and lung development to try and breathe. If, if, perfusion through the umbilical cord is compromised and and you could probably talk more to um, the oxygen saturation of people um, and how in COVID my understanding is it can drop quite significantly and in in obstetrics the ill people we've had here we've seen oxygen drop really fast and, and so the time it takes to make a decision um, to, okay, it's time to have a baby has been really short. C-section rates are much higher um, in women with COVID illness. Uh, not to mention, as you discussed earlier today, the, the experience, which is important. What's it like to have your baby? Um, when you have COVID, you still are allowed a partner to come in, but you're really isolated, limited to the room. Nobody's coming and going as far as family members. Um, you have one partner there with you who probably has been exposed to COVID also. 
everybody's wearing, you know, this is mild, just a mask, but you know, pappers and N95s and super goggles. And sometimes I introduce myself as a spaceman um, because there's just so much equipment on to keep us all keep us all safe and try not to spread to family members. Also, family members are wearing N95s and then also trying not to, to spread to, to babies and babies with who are born to COVID positive moms are also tested at 24 hours of life and then uh, followed up on, on an outpatient basis. So there have been babies that have had COVID right off the bat. So, um, yeah, it's a different it, it's a different experience if you're sick with COVID, even a mild case that you're hospitalized for having your baby. It's still a different experience. Yeah, Dr. Curry, I was wondering if you could comment on some of the long term effects of having been exposed to COVID, even even after mild symptoms, not. Uh, not to speak of a severe illness where, which we have all seen and, and taken care of and have a huge respect for the devastation that a severe case of COVID can cause. But even a mild case, I think there's studies coming out that suggest that there are long-term effects of um, coronavirus. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Um... Yeah, so one of the things, you know, obviously that I, you know, I work in critical care medicine. So one of the, the, the primary organs that I focus on is, is the lungs. Um, so I'll speak mostly to that. Um, but, you know, one of the things we know, because we have enough, enough time now, right, to see the impact um, on people's lungs over time. So even people with mild disease, meaning, you know, people that did never, never acquired hospitalization, um, we know that we are seeing those people now, you know, having problems with their lungs. Um, and those can be very mild, small differences when they then come in for sort of other, you know, other procedures, other, um, you know, scans and things like that, that there can be very, very long-term effects on the lungs, um, which is a fibrotic process, which, you know, for the most part is, is a non-reversible process in the lungs um, once they develop a level of fibrosis. And then the people who are not sick enough to end up in the hospital, this can be a difference that they don't notice at first, right? These are sort of the younger people who can get COVID. They're at home, they have some degree of symptoms, right? So even after COVID, they may or may not notice this, right? But they may notice it at a, you know, when they push themselves to a higher level or as they age and lose that natural lung function um, that, that everyone does to a degree, Right, having that small element of fibrosis there really sets you back, um, and really, you know, puts you at risk for other things as as you age. So we know there are long, long term impacts, um, definitely on lung function. Um, you know, and then there's sort of system wide other problems that can happen that we're seeing um, more and more often. Um, you know, but the lung issues are are one of the things I very commonly see and hear about now. I I just want to add to that that the uh long-term complications of COVID can be rather severe. And, uh, and it doesn't mean you don't have to have, you don't have to get into the hospital to have these complications. In fact, a lot of people with mild disease are experiencing long, long COVID, what we're calling the, the longer term uh, complications of COVID, which is really uh, to be taken seriously. And, and, you know, I know of and have seen some some college students, for example, that uh, they they can't take uh, uh, you know their tests. They can't do well. They are even younger, uh, younger kids who you know school age uh, kids who they just they forget what they were working on a few hours ago or minutes ago. Yeah, um, I, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, Ramsey, I, I recently saw an article in Nature, which I'm looking at right now, which describes the long-term effects of just having COVID. This has nothing to do with the vaccine, just having been um, infected with COVID. And these are some of the numbers that uh, this study has reported. So 80% of individuals report at least one symptom at up to six months 
after recovering from the illness. The number one symptom that people um, complained of was ongoing fatigue. Uh, number two is headache and attention disorder. I think that specifically speaks to what you were talking about with students. Hair loss, these are in order of complaint. Um, and um, also down the list in the five to 10% was this pulmonary fibrosis that Dr. Curry was talking about, which is a long-term effect that is essentially irreversible. So we're still learning a lot about the virus just um, and the long-term effects, but yeah, this is exactly the study that uh, I was just referring to. Um, and while some of these symptoms are maybe just annoying type sim symptoms, some of them are significant. If you look at the top right corner, 44% um, had headache, attention disorder, and anosmia. That's a lack of smell or, or a change in your smell. Um, memory loss in 16%. I mean, that's, <laughs> those are significant numbers, even when we look at Alzheimer's dementia in, as, a, as a societal problem. So there's, I think there's, a, there's much that we have to learn about the long-term effects of COVID. And um, these are not, these shouldn't be just diminished um, or, or taken lightly because we're still learning about the long-term effects. I have a feeling this virus is gonna be with us for a long time and we're gonna to have to learn how to live with it. And, and so the vaccine can prevent you from getting COVID and uh, prevent you from getting uh, these long-term uh, side effects. And I think that's one of the strong arguments for getting the vaccine. And a lot of people have said, oh, I'm healthy, I'm not going to get COVID, or if I do, I'm not gonna get that sick. That's actually uh, incorrect that uh, you, you know, you sick or a lot of younger people and uh, uh, Dr. Curry can speak to that. Uh, definitely, she's seen quite a few. Um, so uh, in fact, Dr. Curry, why don't you, why don't you let us know what, uh, uh, you know, tell, tell us about some of the younger people perhaps that you're seeing that uh, are actually getting uh, very sick with COVID. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, so, you know, so, so one of the, I mean, so one of the big populations we see that are young people that are otherwise healthy, they get COVID are what we were talking about earlier, which is the obstetric population. So pregnant, you know, young pregnant women, um, these are people in their twenties and early thirties who otherwise are completely healthy. Um, but, you know, and, 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 and Gina knows more about the physiologic stress of pregnancy, but, you know, because of something in the physiologic stress of pregnancy, right, they're either coming to us, um, you know, for the purpose of delivery. And then I've also had a lot um, just in the ICU who come immediately postpartum. So they deliver, um, you know, and in that process, um, sort of fluid shifts and such, it sort of just tips their lungs over to the point where they get very, very sick. Um, so that's one group of young people that I've seen. And we've had some that are, you know, very, very sick. Um, I think at least the ones I took care of earlier this year did make it, um, you know, but they were intubated for quite some time, um, several of them. The other thing is there's, you know, I've seen a good number of people in their, um, you know, in their 20s who got COVID and they were some of the most heartbreaking cases um, that I had. Um, that were people in their 20s who, you know, thought they were otherwise healthy people, but they had slightly elevated glucoses or, you know, sort of borderline diabetes that they didn't know they had or borderline hypertension, um, or they were by no means obese, but just slightly overweight. And for some reason, COVID hit them really hard, you know, as people in their 20s. Um, and I mean that sort of everywhere from people who end up on, you know, like high flow nasal cannula, which is sort of a low amount of oxygen that sort of buys you ICU admission to then people who ultimately end up, you know, intubated and don't survive the disease. Um, obviously the ones that don't survive, that's tragic, but to even speak of the people who end up on high flow nasal cannula, um, you know, these are people whose lungs will never be the same. Like they survive and they make it out of COVID and you know, I've talked to a few people now that sort of the vaccine issues have come up and they said, well, I survived COVID. I made it through the ICU, um, but their lungs will never be the same. Um, 
these are people who don't just go through that acute process of COVID ARDS, um, where there's bilateral infiltrates that can go away, but they develop fibrotic lungs, and that fibrosis we know never, never, uh, never dissipates over time, um, and that's even for people who don't end up intubated and do survive COVID. Um, you know, more recently, I've had uh, quite, quite, quite a few of 30 and 40 year olds. Um, every single patient I've had over the last month um, has been unvaccinated. And I've had quite a few 30 and 40 year olds um, that I intubate. I've had quite a few 30 and 40 year olds um, that die on the ventilator um, throughout this course. And I think that's been the hardest thing about this the most recent round of COVID is I'm seeing much, much more young people. You know, another um, question that has been posed to me um, is I, I think that there is a there is a growing doubt in the vaccine because people say it's ineffective. And I try to redirect the conversation from, well, effective at what? And I think that a lot of people have, have said that effectiveness is measured by transmission. Like it doesn't prevent you from getting the virus. And I'd like to hear from some of the panelists, their comments about that, but you know, the vaccine, from my understanding, has was never really intended to prevent transmission, although it was hoped that it would, and there was some strong evidence that it did, at least with the alpha variant. We have some growing numbers that show that, but really the intent and, and, and the real measure of effectiveness of the vaccine was preventing severe illness and death, like Dr. Curry has been talking about. So anybody, uh, like Ramsey, could you speak about the transmissibility, the the um, ability to infect another person with the original alpha variant versus the delta variant, and what, what's the difference? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Dr. Hollenbeck. And the um, it is true that the early effectiveness of the vaccines, uh, as, as shown in this slide uh, captured from the UCSF COVID Grand Rounds last week, the, that you know, it was dramatic. And we were talking in the 90s in the initial trials in terms of prevention of uh, uh, severe disease and uh, perhaps even prevention of infection. And you know that's that's fantastic. We we love that. Uh, the and and that's ideal. But it's not what's necessary, as you were mentioning and alluding to. The uh, really what we need is something to prevent, to protect against uh, severe disease. And so just to, to show everybody uh, the immunity of, uh, uh, against SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID, is uh, you know, important in the nasal cavity, in the mouth, and the lungs. And really, I like this slide from Dr. Crotty here, Shane Crotty at UCSD, showing that uh, here's the spectrum of illness or uh, the symptoms that people can have. And if you think about it, a vaccine that prevented infection obviously is, is, is great uh, and, and better, but a, a, a vaccine that prevents hospitalization that falls somewhere down over here is, uh, you know, is super helpful and is a wonderful thing because it's preventing you to get into the hospital, allowing our healthcare system to function normally, take care of patients with uh, uh, you know, heart attacks and other problems, uh, cancer surgeries, all the other necessary uh, parts of care and keeping people out of the ICU and keeping them from dying. So if you draw, I think right now with Delta uh, for on average, for those that are fully vaccinated, where the average person's probably uh, falling in this asymptomatic or posse immune, meaning uh, posse symptomatic, meaning just a few symptoms uh, if, if they get Delta. So, way, well away from the hospital. And the, most of the patients that we're seeing in the hospital with COVID are they, you know, the COVID was incidental or they already have COPD and 
a lot of people, when they even get a cold virus with COPD, that can send them into the hospital for a few days. Those patients predominantly are doing well and, and not dying. A lot of the deaths of vaccinated people with COVID are not necessarily from COVID. Uh, and and uh, you, have, you have to keep that in mind uh, as well. So we're, we're definitely seeing you know, the, the value of some protection, but to, you know, to be open and honest uh, is that, that people are getting COVID infections who have been vaccinated and you're going to know some of them. In fact, my neighbors did uh, back in June, they were both all vaccinated with Pfizer. So uh, that, that's, uh, that's going to happen. They didn't get very sick. Uh, one of them had a, uh, a fever, was in bed for a couple of days, low grade fever, and uh, then fine. And the other one just felt a little bit off and she was fine. So uh, just, just to show you. And one thing to talk about with this is this concept of memory. And, and one reason why people are getting infected now after having had the vaccine is that your, your B cell immunity, the antibody levels are falling, but uh, you still have a memory response. Your immune system has a memory response but that memory response takes a little while to kick in, a couple of days perhaps to kick in fully. So such that you are, uh, you know, you might experience some symptoms, but your body will eventually get the get hold of the infection, and that's what's important to uh, remember. That's that's what's causing uh, people to get some symptoms, but still preventing them from getting very ill from the vaccine. So uh, just just to go on a little bit, uh, the you know talk a little bit about uh, Johnson Johnson. There's some data to suggest that the duration of immunity lasts long. Uh, there will be a second dose. Uh, was uh, you know just released on August 25, and uh, you know there there are breakthrough infections. They're happening. But most of those uh, uh, patients are staying out of the hospital, which is uh, which is beautiful. If you look at uh, the CDC reports that you know hospital infections and hospitalizations by vaccination status in LA County, which is uh, you know a massive uh, population that, that's bigger than a lot of countries, uh, that 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 they are. Uh, Having, uh, if you look here at the rolling seven day hospitalization rates, fully vaccinated people with the solid blue line are really uh, not getting hospitalized at significant rates. Whereas if you look at the unvaccinated with this dashed line, uh, it, as of the end of July, it was just going up and up. And same with infection rates. Infection rates up here going up and up for those who are unvaccinated, but uh, not very high for those that are vaccinated, but there are some cases, as I mentioned. So the vaccine is probably preventing quite a few cases, but most importantly, it's preventing you from ending up in the hospital. Yeah, doctor, as for that, that those graphs seem to really capture what the medical community is trying to accomplish with the vaccine. The vaccine is not going to eradicate the SARS-CoV-2 virus anytime soon. What we're trying to do is manage the severe illness and death, keep that to a minimum so that our hospital system doesn't get overrun. And there have been many systems, health systems in our country who have been at or beyond their capacity to care for patients. And um, I think that we should spend a little bit of time talking about what that looks like and why it's so important to avoid our hospital systems from getting overrun. Are there any, anyone who cares to comment on that? I'll, I'll comment on that. I mean, it, uh, one of the things that's been very frustrating is um, when patients come to us with diseases that we can treat and we can treat very well and we're very experienced at when there are no beds 
when there are no ambulances because they're being used to transport um, COVID patients um, or because there's no staff because they have COVID. And people with diseases that they could be fully treated from and fully recover from often have worse outcomes. And um, it's very frustrating and sad uh, for, um, uh, especially in the emergency room, they take, I think, mostly the brunt of it. Um, is to, to see these delays in care that um, don't have to happen. And, and that that's, to me, um, uh, a highly vaccinated community would allow the medical system that exists there to be able to continue to care for all of the other types of things that tend to happen that we're, that we're also quite good at treating. I think the, um, the other thing, uh, the other topic uh, to me that, um, is important, um, um, Dr. Ashworth, if you want to uh, point to it, is that um, that variants will develop um, as uh, as long as the virus is continuing to replicate. Can you talk about how um, a high vaccination rate could help decrease the number of um, increasingly dangerous variants from um, from being able to be be created? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, the the uh, uh, variants are uh, quite a concern, obviously, with Delta we're seeing, and uh, the vaccine doesn't get, uh, uh, you know, th does not change. Sorry, the virus itself does not change very rapidly, and uh, we we have to keep that in mind. This is from the World Health Organization, uh, where, where I used to work, actually about uh, vaccine variants, and we'll, uh, we'll have a link for you. You can watch this uh, short video. Uh, the, uh, and, and, and why, uh, sorry, virus variants and why they uh, might change. And so uh, this is a, uh, a, a major concern. And the virus, even though it doesn't change that quickly or mutate that quickly uh, in any person, but if you multiply that by 500 uh, million people, or probably in the, in, the, in the world, 500 million people have been infected, uh, uh, even though the, the data uh, it sounds a little bit uh, lower than that about, you know, a lot of places where we're not detecting uh, all of the cases, but regardless, uh, you, know, at, you know, hundreds of millions, literally hundreds of millions of people have been infected and each one of those people has millions of copies of the virus. And uh, if it mutates once in a million times, well, just do the math, there's uh, lots of opportunity for mutations. And when a mutation happens, most of the time, it damages the virus and it doesn't uh, cause, it causes that uh, pre-strain, if you will, to just die out. But the, uh, you know, if the uh, if it confers more infectiousness, if the virus all of a sudden is more infectious, then it will take off, and that's what happened with the strain, uh, the beta variants in the UK uh, earlier on, and that's what happened with Delta in India, um, and, and when they had a substantial outbreak that they've gotten under significant control. So. Uh, the, uh, you know, th this is a problem. That's why, another reason why we want to do whatever we can to prevent transmission, not just vaccinations, but don't forget about masks and masking, especially indoors. And I always say that the, the riskiest, uh, sadly, the riskiest activity you can do is eat in a restaurant indoors. Outdoors is uh, relatively safe. Indoors is uh, is riskier because a lot of obviously people have their masks up in order to eat. So these are things that we also need to do to decrease the rates of variants. But vaccines, by reducing the numbers of infections uh, and reducing the number of infected people, will uh, decrease uh, the amount of variants just because there's fewer people getting infected. Also, uh, vaccines may decrease the duration of illness. So even if you get an infection and uh, in, in one study, viral loads 
uh, were relatively high in infected and uninfected people in an outbreak in uh, Cape Cod, but uh, the duration of illness is much shorter in the infected people, and the uh, and none of the infected people, of course, uh, ended up in the hospital from their I mean, outbreak. So, people, Doctor Sorry, uh, sorry, none of the vaccinated people, correct, uh, ended up in the hospital. The, the vaccinated people. And so that that the implication is that the shorter duration of infection in vaccinated people means there's fewer opportunities for replication of the virus in each person who's in, infected but vaccinated, and therefore fewer opportunities for a lethal variant to develop. Is that yeah. is that correct? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, we're coming up, uh, it's 9.32, um, and so uh, uh, wanted, does anybody have any, um, uh, any other comments to make? Otherwise, um, I'll invite Dr. Asford to, uh, to help us wrap up uh, the evening session. Would any of the participants um, care to ask any questions? Any of the, the viewers, I mean. I haven't seen anything in the chat box either. Okay. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Asfor, uh, Dr. Curry, Dr. Hollenbeck, uh, Dr. Flum is uh, birthing a baby right now. So uh, welcome a new, new child into the world. And so, uh, um, regardless of your vaccination status, please wear your masks, wash your hands, uh, practice uh, physical distancing. Uh, those uh, public health measures, they work um, to help, help the spread of infection and keep our rates down. Um, and uh, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. And thank, thank you to all the panelists for, uh, for their time and their expertise and their passion about this topic. All right. Um, thank you, everybody. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Okay. Have a good night. Yeah. Thanks.